So the topic today is on conflict. It's on, it's on conflict. We look at our lives. They're all, it's all nice in here. Like we, we're, we're, How are you doing? Oh, fine. And you? Oh, bless. I'm ble- God bless you. And, and we have these like routine responses when really it's not okay. It's not blessed. You're not, you're not really having that. We all have issues. We all have scuffles. We all have fights. Some of you are about ready to kill the kids on the way here, okay? And you walk into here, and you're like, okay, good morning. Go to class. I'll kill you later, you know? <laughs> Get in there. <laughs> I'm doing good. And I know, because I've been there, okay? I have kids, too. So we all have scuffles. We all have fights, and we all have issues, and we, we mask it, and we put on. And you know what? Sometimes we try to mask it. And put on like with laughter, or we try to go places even, go have some fun somewhere and act like it's okay. We come back from that, or it really isn't okay. Proverbs actually says in verse four, chapter 14, verse 13, says, laughter can't mask a heavy heart. And when the laughter ends, the grief remains. And that's a sad reality, actually. Some of us, we take good notes in here. We walk right back out there to that old world that, and the grief remains and some of us i believe some of us are really going through it some of us are wearied by the cover-up of conflict and by the pain of what our conflict and our uh, that it's and here's here's even a, a scary thing is and this is true for some of you is that even the people closest to you don't even know how bad it hurts don't even know how bad it is and so we just cover up we've masked it with a laughter with smile and it's not okay we act like it's okay, but in reality, it, it's, it's not okay. And few people actually handle conflict the right way, at least the biblical way. I'm sure there's a lot of different ways to handle the conflict and the challenges that we um, go through in life, but, but few of us actually apply the biblical principle of handling, of dealing with that conflict. So let me give you, let me give you like the five most common that I see, the five most common responses to conflict. And really, really, it is the mask. It's when we respond this way, it's actually just masking it. It's not really dealing with it. It's not really getting to the heart. It's not really healing and providing freedom in that experience of that conflict. It's just another mask that we wear. So write them down. You might, you may find yourself responding to conflict in one or more of these uh, responses. Here it is. Number one, one of the ways that we try to, we're tempted really to handle conflict in this way is, write it down this way, we dominate it. We dominate it. Just power up on that conflict. Take control of that situation. And I'm just going to, I'm going to dominate this into submission. And, and so some of you live with this kind of person. And you're like, say that, Pastor. Amen. Keep on this just for a moment longer. Because we live with maybe that person who, so when they get, when the fight happens, their, their response is usually like, because I said so. That's why, right? Because I said so. That's, and then that's the end of discussion, period. I said it. And so they yell a lot. They try to demonstrate. Their, their power and their, and their dominance. And so the way that they fix the conflict is by taking control of it, by dominating. I'm just going to, there's a conflict, I'm going to control this thing. It's going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. It's because I said it's going to happen. Okay. That's, that's one of the ways that we respond to conflict. And honestly, it's a mask that you're wearing because you're really not getting to the heart of any issue. You're not experiencing healing. You're not experiencing freedom. You're just dominating it. Here's the second response that sometimes we have, and that is the opposite of dominate is ignore it. Some of you just ignore it, you know? It's just like, uh, some of you, this is your conflict resolution style, all right? You just, you think, you buy into the myth, if I could just leave it, if I could just like leave it alone for long enough, it'll just fade away. Maybe it'll just, it'll just fade out of existence if I just ignore it for long enough. And you buy into this myth that, that time heals, all wounds, you ever hear that? And time does not heal a thing. Actually, if you have a wound and you don't get it treated in a timely manner, what happens? It festers, it gets cankerous and stinky, okay? It affects the other parts of the body, all right? That's what happens. The Bible actually says it creates a bitter root. And it's actually harder to take out now and uproot out of our life. The longer we ignore it and we try to, oh, I hope that goes away, it's a mask that we're wearing. It's only getting worse underneath, Okay? Here's a third response to conflict that we're tempted, some of us, to do it this way, and that is we just whine about it. We just, so don't fix it. I mean, that's too much work to fix the conflict. Can I just talk to you about it? Can I just want, Can I just complain? I just need to complain about it. They fuss a lot. The theme song of the people that like to do this 
This is their conflict resolution style, is, is nobody knows the trouble. You know what I'm saying? That's just everywhere. They, they just want to talk about it to everybody. These people, the way they solve the conflict is just make everybody else miserable too. If I can just make everybody else miserable, then, then I mean, if I'm going to suffer, so will you. So I'm just going to destroy the whole family. Here we go. You know, let me just complain about everything. All right. So we just complain. Our, our, the conflict resolution style here is just complain my way through it. I'm going to complain my way through this and it doesn't fix anything. Here's the fourth way, and that is to white flag it. The white flag. Wait, you raise the white flag. OK, I surrender. I give up. I give in. And some of you actually think that this is the godly way to handle conflict, to just peace at all costs, peace at all costs, you know? All right, you win, you win, you win, you win. You win. I just, I, I give in. You're the winner. You're the winner. And you're still holding on to that on the inside. Like it's still eating you up. You're, you're, you're just, you're wanting it to be okay, but it's not okay. It isn't. So we just white flag it. And the last one really is a tragedy. Too many people do this. And this is kind of, I think the preferred choice of our generation when conflict happens, and that is to end it. To end it. Let's just end it, you know. Why don't I just go my way, you go your way, and that'll solve everything. That is, I, I, I spoke to a guy not, not too long ago about, uh, this is like, he had this, this argument with his brother. It was a fight. And when I, when I found out what the fight was, I mean, it was just the dumbest thing that they were arguing about but it was so meaningful to them in the moment that he said, okay, that, that was their response. Like, you just go do your thing. I'm going to do, do my thing, and everything's going to be fine. And it wasn't fine, he, or else I wouldn't be talking to him about this issue that he's having and what it's caused in his family. You go that way. I, I go this way. Let's just, let's just end it, and it doesn't work. And some of you are holding this card, maybe even in your relationship. You're holding this card in your marriage. You have a little card in your wallet that says end it. And you're just, you go, you're just ready to pull it out. Like, if you just... All right, you just keep, you, if you stop making me happy, if you don't do, like, I just, I'll pull the card on, because I don't have to take that. I don't have to take you. I don't need to deal with that. And so you have this conflict style, this way out to just end it, to just cut it off. And these are wrong ways to respond to conflict. These are just, these are not the way that the Bible teaches us on how to, and although some, we're tempted, we really are tempted to deal with them. These easy fixes, mask it, cover it up, don't really deal with the real issue here. But I'd like to share with you a relationship principle out of the, the Bible that can really, man, give you so much revelation and healing today. You're gonna, it is a simple principle. I, I will tell you, it's simple. It's so simple. It's almost overly simplistic. Um, but few people, let me say it this way, like it is simple. And you're gonna say, oh yeah, 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 that's, that makes sense. But very few people are willing to walk outside these doors and obey God's word and to do his way. And it, it, it is, I'm telling you, it is, it, but, but I, would, I would just ask you, how are these other ways working for you so far? You dominating it, you ending it, you, you surrendering to it. Do you feel better? You feel better about your relationships? No, God. Can I, so why don't you give God a try and God's word a try? And, and like I've said kind of repeatedly throughout this series, let me ask you to do something with me and just don't push back on me for the next 20 minutes, okay? Because what I'm going to say is, is going to, it, it, it is, you're going to want to say, no, 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 wait, wait a minute now. And, and I just, I want you to open your heart to God's word and what he has to say, because maybe, just maybe, there is another solution. There is another way to deal with conflict. Maybe through God's word, there is actually a solution that is going to work and bring healing and freedom into our relationships. Does that sound good, you guys? Amen. All right, you guys, here's, I'm going to give you, a, this relationship principle comes out of James chapter 1, um, verse, just two verses there, and, and really take, taking those verses, di digging into those two verses, I'm going to show them to you in a moment, but James, the book of James was written by James, the brother of Jesus, not James, the, the disciple, there's a couple different James in the Bible, this is actually J Jesus's younger brother, for some of you that don't know, Jesus had brothers and sisters. They were half-brothers and sisters because Jesus' actual father was God, the Holy Spirit. Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So, so Joseph, though, after Jesus was born, has more kids, we're told in the Bible. Joseph and Mary. And one of those brothers, half-brothers of Jesus was, was James, which I think is pretty cool, man. If you don't believe, like, you know, Jesus is Lord because of, like, the resurrection and the miracles, I mean, 
how, how much would it have take for his younger brother to actually be convinced that his older brother is Lord? You know what I'm saying? Uh, let me ask it this way. How many of you can convince your brother that you're, that you're Lord, okay? That's got to be hard, man. To me, that's like evidence of his Savior. That's the Messiah right there. His own little brother. Because you know they had fight anyway. Okay, I'm just saying. That's good stuff, man. James chapter 4, verse 1. He asks, he starts with this question, and I'd like to ask you guys, what causes fights and quarrels among you? So what causes them? What causes the fights and the quarrels? To which your first response to that question is going to be easy. It's him, okay? It's a, I brought him today. You don't even know. Like, or your response is going to be, it's, it's, uh, it's her. It's, it's this other person. That's, that's, it's him, you know? And that's the easy first response that we're always going to because if you could just see, though, Pastor, no, seriously, if you just come into my life, I could show you where all the problem is coming from. Just go home with me. Let me I will show you where the fights are coming from. It's that person I work with. It's my demanding boss. They're the one causing all that pain, you know, and, and, and I'm serious. This is, it's someone, or some of you even blame it on the devil. That's where the fight, fight's coming from. It's the devil. It's, the, it's this evil world, you know, this wicked, evil world, which, which if, if I were to give you like some time and space, I'm sure every one of us has a good reason for every circumstance. Like you can make a pretty good case of why it is that other person. I know you could. You, could, you, you, you can make a pretty good case of why it's him or her or them or even the devil or this broken world. You can make a good case about it. But, but James is about to tell us, what's really going on, that there is, there, he's going to jump up in our business a little bit and tell us what really is going on behind all of this stuff, you guys. And I know that we could, again, come up with some pretty convincing arguments, but there's something in us to this initial reaction to conflict to, uh, to, conflict, to always come up with somebody other than us, or the reason. We blame. They say, oh, it's, it's their fault, which, by the way, I have how is that working again for you? How is that blaming thing working for you? Are, you? are you happier? I have never heard anyone say, by the way, well, you know, I just blamed enough people in my life and now I feel great. I'm just, I, I'm just better off now. That just doesn't happen, right? You don't blame your way into happiness. It does not happen. It doesn't, it doesn't work. So here's what James says. He says, okay, what's causing all those fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, that battle inside of you? Like, is, it's really something inside of you. James, again, just kind of jumps in our business a little bit and said, you know what? What would it be like if you just pause for a moment and consider that something might be going on inside of you? I mean, maybe that's the reason why you're so mad. Maybe that's the reason why you're so angry, that it might be something inside of you or the reason why you're so hard to live with or that this is, you know, and I know this is where I'm getting some pushback right now. Like you're, I can feel it in the, in, in the room. It's like, no, it's not me. It's not. It really isn't. I know. No, I can. It's, it is. It's really them. Do you know, like, what the common denominator of all your fights are? Every one of your fights. You know what the common denominator is? You. I don't know about you, but I was there for every one of my fights. There I was, right in the middle of them, arguing my way. This is what you did. I was there. I don't know about you. But the common denominator in every fight, you guys, is it's you. So what really, what really is causing the angst? It's causing the turmoil. It's causing the quarrel. Could it be that the source is, is us instead of them, instead of who we're blaming? Then he says it clearly in verse 2. He says, you want something, but you don't get it. This, this right here, you want something, but you don't get it. Now, isn't it true that every fight, every argument that you get into, that you've ever been into, is because you wanted something and you didn't get it? Every fight. You wanted it to go this way, and it's not going that way. You wanted, you wanted something, and you didn't get it. That is every, every fight that we've ever been into is right there because you cut me off, and I wanted that spot. You, 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 uh, you know, now I'm, I'm mad. I wanted something I didn't get. I wanted peace, and I'm not getting peace. I wanted the house clean, and it's not clean. I wanted money, in the, and there's no money now, and I wanted, and I wanted something, and I'm, and I'm not getting it. And so, and so now I'm, I'm upset, and, I'm, and there's going to be a quarrel. There's going to be a fight. And you did what, when that happens, you did what this next line says, you kill and covet. Which I know some of you, well, I know I'm not perfect, Pastor, but I never killed anybody. But, but could it be, yeah, have you ever thought, could it be that, that with your words, you're killing people? 
Like you're killing them on the inside with your words, or maybe even behind their back, you're killing somebody's reputation. Because like the initial scripture, because you're maneuvering and manipulating behind the scenes, wearing your mask, trying to take control of that conflict, that situation, so you think the way I'm going to do it is tear them down behind their back. Could it be that you're killing people with your actions and your reactions and with your, with your words? That we're destroying people. We kill and we covet. And let's be honest, every one of us do this. Don't Come on, every single one of us are tempted to respond to conflict this way. I don't know about you, when I get into a conflict, my mind starts immediately rehearsing, like as the person is talking, I'm thinking of the lines I'm gonna give back. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Like you're thinking like, uh, and I'm telling you, I can come up with some zingers, man. I can, I just wait, I'm waiting to jump in like it's, it's, it's a rap battle or something. Like, come on, I'm getting in on this thing, I'm gonna get you. And, and, and sometimes when I'm even removed from the situation, I'm thinking about it, I will, I'll rehearse the whole like, oh, then they're gonna say this, and then I'll say that, man. And, and I'm like, ooh, that's a good, I'm gonna write that one down. I need to remember that because I'm gonna, I'm gonna get them. We kill and we covet. I want you to see this next part, but you cannot have what you want. Here is a revelation for some of you today. Listen to this. You, you cannot have everything you want. You, you can't, you can't. And this is, this is in, in contrast to our generation and to, to what, what really is, is what we're struggling with because people really think, they do think, no, Jason, I can have everything I want. And you know what? I am entitled to have everything I want. I am. And as long as you have that level of expectation, you're always going to be disappointed. Can I give you another great revelation that could set you free? You ready for this? The earth was not designed to satisfy all of your desires, and neither were, were people. Neither were people. Isn't it true that when you want something but you didn't get it, that's who we go after. You go after people. So we fuss and we complain and we send that email. Or you post that status or comment. You march, march down to that office or to that door or in that bedroom and you go ahead and, 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 and it escalates more. Here's the key idea though, that you're trying to get something from someone that they can't give you. That's, you're trying to get something from someone they can't and they can never give it to you. But what would happen if in the middle of that, like, yes, you're still, you still have the appetites, you still have those desires, you still have that, 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 that kind of temptation. But what would happen if in the middle of, of that conflict and those feelings that you just paused? If you just stopped and didn't respond to them? I'm telling you what would happen. It would take the angst off of your anger. And then you do this. He says, you do not have because you did not ask God. You, so you're looking, you're looking to people to meet your need. When God was the only one that could ever meet your need and satisfy. James is basically saying that this is the solution to your conflict. That guess what? It's not them. It's not everybody else. It's you. It's me. Because you want something and you're not getting it. So you kill people and you say things and you fight and you argue and you quarrel. And guess what? You can't have everything you want. So what you need to do is you need to go talk to God about it. That's what we need to do. Talk to God. Let me tell you why we're not willing to do this. Most of us are not willing to do this. You know why? Because we know it would stop it right there. It would, it would just squash that conflict right there. And we don't want it squashed. Why? Because we want it our way. We would rather have it our way than God's way. We're afraid of taking it to God. Because you know what? That probably isn't my way. Because I'd rather have it. So, so I, I really don't want to ask God about this situation. And so we, we respond and we send the email and we make the complaint. We fire the person. We divorce the person. We yell at the kids. We do whatever. We go roaring down that hall, yelling at whoever. And God says, just ask me. Just, just ask me what you want. Stop trying to get that from other people. Stop quarreling and fighting and just ask me, and here's what you're going to find out when you do that, that maybe when you do that, maybe you're, a part, you're more a part of the problem than you initially thought. And, and, just, and maybe God actually has some other solutions to that issue or that conflict that you're not seeing in your flesh. Just maybe there's another way. And so what do we learn from James chapter 1, verses 1 and two, let me give you a few takeaways that I want you to try. 
very practical. These are just so practical, you guys. And here's, here's my challenge. My challenge to you is just for this week, one week, when you get that conflict, when, when, some, when, you ha- when you want something and you're not getting it, whatever that looks like, you guys, and whatever relationship that looks like in sphere that looks like, my challenge to you is to stop responding the way that the mask, I'm wearing those masks of dominating and surrendering to it or just whining about it and just, just stop handling it that way and, and do these takeaways. And I'm going to give you four takeaways today. I challenge you to do that. And, and then I want to know, I want to know what difference that God made in your life as you obeyed his word instead of trying to do it your way and covering it up. Just one week. Just give God one week, and I'm telling you, you're going to see the difference of operating by God's word does in your life. All right, here it is. Just, what's good? So what does God's word say? What's, what are some tools that t- Monday, today, you can start to apply these to your life, and you can see change. You can see a difference being made in the conflict. Because maybe James is saying, maybe maybe you're blaming and pointing fingers, and you're too, too focused on, on what's going on out there, and it could just be there's something inside of you. So here's step number one. This is what we need to do. Inside of every conflict, first thing we need to do is, write it down, look within myself. That's what I need to do. And oh, the temptation is there to just, this is the last thing we're inclined to do because we're, some of you are still convinced, like you're still thinking, okay, pastor, I'll take your challenge. I mean, I'll write down the point, but no, seriously, it is them. Like, I'm just, I'm telling you, pastor, it's them, it's them. It's them. I just, okay, pastor, I'll do it. But really, trust me, I promise you, if you, if you just give me 10 minutes after the service, I mean, I could tell you, I could, you could agree with me, that's them. They are, they're, they're the problem, they're the issue, okay? But even G- Jesus is saying, like, and God is saying, that's not the real issue. Look what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, and you pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? To which even reading that, some of you are still going, no, no, I get it, Pastor, but the plank is in their eye. I'm the one with the sawdust, right? That's, I know what you're thinking, but Jesus is saying, like, no, 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 that is, that is reverse. It doesn't matter what you're looking at because it's the perspective. He's saying, he's saying, no, 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 how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? Have you ever realized how tough we are on people, like other people, but how gracious, gracious we are on ourselves? Have you ever realized, you guys, how we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, but we go after people? We just, we go after them, we'll tear them up. Have you ever realized how we judge ourselves based on our intentions, like what we meant to say, and we judge other people on what they really did say, what they really did do? So we've done it for so long, I think we've just become accustomed, we that it's not us, and we've actually become professionals at just responding. And we live in this kind of society that is like an argumentative, you know, just, just controversial society where we like to be right. Do you know that you could be totally right and totally wrong at the same time? <laughs> you, could be, you could be right and wrong, and, and some of us um, have learned how to defend our cause so well. And man, I'll take it to court, and I can prove it, and I can, and I can, and I can, you know, argue with, and I can argue with this person, and I can technically, technically, I can win because I can, I can just. But really, you're losing. And some of you, you're like, you're so good with your words, you're so good in the argument, you're so good at making your case. You've become, you've become so professional at blaming other people all the time that technically you win, but inside you are losing. You're losing. So before you fire off that comment on Facebook, before you send off that email, before you storm down that hall, before you try to make your case that you want something and you're not getting it, the first step is look within yourself. That look within, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to project out here, I'm going to look within myself. Then number two, what you need to do is talk to God first. Circle first right there or something. It's just, that's so important. Talk to, before you go to other people, before you discuss it, before you make your case, before you build a case, before you build followers to your case, go talk to God first. Can I tell you how much of our conflicts in life would be just gone, eradicated, if we just followed this principle right here, if, if we talk to God 
first. You know what? I'm getting a little mad. I'm getting, I'm getting a little bit upset in this. I'm just, can I just, I'm going to walk away. I need to go pray. I just need to go pray. And then let me just, let me just go pray. How many of our arguments and conflicts would be solved if we just walked away in the middle of it and stopped trying to plead our case and get our way and dominate it or end it or whatever escalation it, it gets to and we just walk away and pray? I'm telling you that, 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 that would, one of my tricks in marriage counseling is, is actually to, to do this, to pray. And, and not only, I, I won't pray, just pray, but I have, I have them pray. You know, because I have couples, you know, will come into my office sometimes and they're at each other. You know, they're, they're experiencing unhealth and issues. And, and so I'll say, hey, you guys, before we get started, you know, can, let's pray. And they're thinking, I could tell, like every time they're thinking like, yes, let's pray. <laughs> please, please pray. And, and I can tell, and so I'm like, okay. But then what I do is I say, hey, you know what, man, can you, can you just pray for your wife? Can you pray a blessing in God's grace? And, 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 his, and over your wife. And you know what? When he's, when he's done, man, can you just pray over your husband? Just pray God's, God's blessing over his life, however he leads you. Can you do that? And, and it always starts off weird, right? They don't know what to say. Like, uh, uh, and uh, God, get him, God. Get him. And it always starts off like, like show him, like, uh, uh, God, mercy God. And it just starts off really weird, and really awkward, but then as the prayer gets on, I notice it gets, it gets lighter and softer, and then and God starts to just make his way through that mess, and, and because that's what God does when you involve him, when you go to him first and you involve him in the process, the way you go into God's presence is not how you leave God's presence, you guys. So when you start to go to God first, you come out with a different mind on the conflict and on the issue. You see this even in, in David's Psalms. You, see, you ever read the Psalms and how, like David you read the beginning of the psalm and how different it is from the end of the psalm? Like the beginning, you just read the first couple of verses of one psalm. I dare you to do that like later on today. Read the first couple of verses of, the, of a psalm and then read the last couple of verses. It's totally different. David enters into God's presence like, God, are you even there? Like, are you listening, God? What's your problem, man? And he's just like venting all this stuff to God. And then at the end, he's like, oh, but you will never leave me and forsake me. And your name is worthy to be praised. And it's just... There's this difference. Why? Because you cannot leave God's presence the same. So now, my first step is, yeah, God, I'm, I need to look within here. But then my second step needs to be, I'm actually going to go to you first, God. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to pray. And not, I'm not going to use prayer as my last response. It's going to be the first resort. I'm gonna, I need to go pray because there's an issue going on. Philippians actually says it this way, chapter 4. Don't be anxious about anything. But in all those issues, in all those, those problems, in all those arguments, in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present those to God first. Like, like present your, like talk to God before you go talk to, to people. And, and what's going to happen? Here's what's going to happen. This is what the Bible says. That the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's what's going to happen. If you just paused, just, and, and we've lost the art in our culture today of the pause. And we want to want to fire back. We want a quick solution. We want to get to the bottom of it. We want it our way, and we want it now. And God is saying, pause, stop. Just, just can you listen before you speak? Actually, Proverbs 18 says, whoever answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. And I know it's talking about other people, like listen to other people, but I think the principle applies too to God. Like listen to God first before you, I'm telling you, you're just going to bring shame on your life. You're going to bring shame on your career. You're going to bring shame on your marriage if you, don't, if you don't start listening to God first. Can I get an amen? amen? Some of you, you got invited to church and they set you up and huh? you said, man, gosh, this is, yeah. It's okay. Here's, here's, here's the third thing that we need to do. And that is, the third step, and that is let God do a work inside of us. Let God do a work inside of us. Now, I'm getting ready to tell you something that you're not going to like. I don't like it either. I guess this isn't, this isn't cool. But, but as your pastor, I don't, know, I don't just tell you things that you want to hear. I need to tell you truth. Okay? I need, I need to ex tell you the truth. So, so here it is. God uses this stuff. Yeah. 
Like God, God, you keep asking God to take that conflict away, and God is going, no, no, I like it right where it is. It's doing, it's doing something in your life. It's actually, it's, it's performing something, and I don't like this either about it. That's why I say that. Like, I don't like this about, you know, it, but God actually allows conflict in our life. Now, the Bible says God doesn't tempt us, but God does allow tests, and for us to be tested and to go through the furnace or, or the, of the trial of perfecting our faith. Why? Because he wants us to grow up. So parents, we do this. We tell our kids when they want to go off and play and they want to go do their own thing, we tell them, no, 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 go to your room, do your homework. We, we, we inflict like, suffering and pain on some of us. Some of us have intentionally caused physical pain on our children for the purpose of character development. Right? <laughs> and we think God doesn't operate you know, the same way way that we think god we go to god like we expect god to be our heavenly santa claus give me give me give me give me give me that's not how it works god is like nah man you're my kids you're my kids and and i gotta work inside of you so go to your room no you can't go play go to your room do your homework and sometimes he needs there's there's some chastisement and discipline that takes place for the development of our character here's another revelation for you you need to know this about God, okay? And that is, if you don't learn it, you do it over again, okay? God does not flunk you. He doesn't. Some of you are trying to get out of the very school that God is using to teach you and develop you, all right? But God, God will never flunk you. He, no, he doesn't. He just has you go through the test again and again. It, 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 and could it be that the reason why you're, you, you, you are continuing to have the same conflicts and issues appear over and over and over again in your life is because the way you're responding to the conflict is prolonging it? Could, could, that, be, could that be why? That this is happening, that God is actually trying to teach us something and it'll show up again and again until we start responding and learning, until we say, God, okay, God, do a work inside of me then. Change, change, change me, God. And you just, re, you, or else you have to retake the test until you do get it. I'm, this isn't just me. I'm telling you, this is the Bible. This is, look at First Peter chapter 1. This is what it says. He says, so be glad that that person is mean to you, right? Be glad that that person is getting on your nerves, okay? Be glad because there is a wonderful joy ahead, even though the, there is going, there, the going is rough for a while down here. These trials are only a, the test of your faith to see whether or not it is strong and pure. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, which means you have to get it pretty hot to purify gold. And your faith is far more precious to God than mere gold. So if your faith remains strong after being tried in the test tube of fiery trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day of his return see god cares for you so much that's why but we if we don't pause if we just click that send button if you just storm down if you just argue if you just try to get your way instead of talk to god first and say god do a work inside of me talk to god first god change me and then we say okay lord how can i grow what are you trying to do inside of me let him do it. Here's the bottom line. Here's the big idea kind of of the message and of the day in my mind. And that is this. Number four, we have to stop expecting from man what could only come from God. Stop expecting from people what only God can give you. See, this world, we're, we keep wanting the world to satisfy our desires and people to satisfy our desire, desires. But, but listen, what if we actually depended on God to satisfy our desires, to satisfy our needs? That when we're not getting what we want here with people, that it doesn't crush us, that we have to roll up on it, that we have to demand it and end it and manipulate and shift things around, but that, you know what? My source is God. He is the, he is the, the, the only one that I depend on. Listen, 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 please, listen. Hey, church, can you lower your expectation of people and higher your expectation of God. Can you do that? Like some of you have, your expectation of people is so high, they are bound to fail you. They are bound to disappoint you. You're, you don't even hold yourself to that expectation. Can you just lower your expectation of people 
and higher your expectation on God. Psalm says it this way. Let your unfailing love surround us, O Lord, for our hope is not in, it's not in this world. It's not in people even. My hope is in you alone, God. Come on, let's bow our heads right there with that and go to God in prayer. Let's be very still here. I want you to respond to the Holy Spirit. And there's kind of, there's about two different responses that you can have to a message like this. The first one is some of you need a relationship with God today. Like, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about joining church. I'm talking about a relationship, like an intimate and vibrant relationship with God. And today you notice that that, is, that might be what's missing in your life. See, the problem, some of us, we've, we've made a decision some time ago to have God in our life, but we really haven't done anything about it like in a long time. Like, like a lot of you have God in your life. You're here in church. I mean, you, God's in your life, but he's just not number one in your life. He's not the priority in your life. And can I tell you something? God, God will not take any other place in your life unless it's first place. That's, that's the only place that God will take. He doesn't just want to be a part of your life. He wants to be Lord of your life. And maybe you're putting too much expectation on this world. Maybe you're putting too much expectation on people. And today you need to shift that expectation again. And get that. really this is what salvation is. Salvation is submitting everything in your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be saved. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. That's it. That's all you have to do. Put him first in your life. So with every head bowed and eye closed, I want to pray a prayer with you of, really it's a prayer of reprioritizing, of making Jesus the Lord of your life. Some of you, that's the response today that you need to make. So with every head bow and eye closed, I want you, you know, I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out, but I want to pray for you right where you're seated, this prayer of surrender, this prayer of just making Jesus number one. For some of you, you need to do it again. You've kind of gotten off track. Some of you, it's the very first time you're going to pray something like this. And I'd love the privilege to help you with some words to say, to talk to God right now and start a new life. Clean slate, a fresh start today. Come on, with every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you today, will you just be bold and lift up your hand right now? Lift it and I say, Pastor, pray for me. I need that. I want to make Jesus my Lord. Yes, amen, amen, amen. Come on, lift it high. Lift it up. Yes, yes, declare it. Yes, 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 yes. All over. Yeah, in the back. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah, amen, amen. Yes, young lady, proud of you. Go ahead and put your hands down, everybody. Pray this. Pray it like this. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, God, I declare that you're my Lord. You're the Lord of my life, my entire life. I place you in first place of my heart. Come take control, take over, and make me brand new. God, I'm going to lower my expectation on people. I'm going to lower my expectation on this world, and I'm lifting my expectation of you, God. I put my hope in you and you alone, God. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, God, for giving me a clean slate and a fresh start. And I pray over every person, God, that we're going to take this challenge of your word, that we're not going to wear the mask of conflict and pretend that we don't have fusses and fights and quarrels. It's really happening. We're not going to pretend like it's not. We're going to not handle it the way that the world handles it, the way that we were taught maybe, or the way that we kind of are tempted and inclined to handle conflict and blame other people. But God, right now, we just help us, God, to look within first. God, do a work inside of my heart. Would you just tell God, do a work inside of my life, inside of my heart. You're trying to teach me something through this, God. And I want to learn it. I want to grow. Grow me up. Develop my faith and my character. God, I give you the room to do that in my life through this conflict and through this trial. And ultimately, God, I put my hope in you. I put my trust in you. I, I don't need to have control of every situation. I don't need for everything to go my way down here. I'm okay with it not going my way, God. I submit it to you. 
You are in control. You are Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you prayed something like that, will you give God some praise right now? Amen.